On this episode of Stack Chat, Spotify engineer Matt Brown tells us how Kubernetes helps power the teams that power Spotify. Increased deployments and higher productivity are just the start. Uh, thanks for joining me, Matt. So how does Spotify work? When you use Spotify in your laptop, your mobile phone, um, a speaker in your house, uh, your app is connected to a layer of services that we call the perimeter, a um, series of gateways, load balancers, things like that. And then from there, depending on what you're doing in the app, you're connected to one of hundreds or probably about a thousand different microservices that are developed. We used to run these all in our own data center, but over the years we moved fully to Google Cloud. Um, and those microservices, which are all talking to each other, are developed by about 200 different teams within Spotify. Um, and they're deploying those, building those independently. Um, based on, you know, one team might work on the search feature, or the playlist feature, just different features like that. Um, and then we have another group of teams of infrastructure teams where we're trying to build tools for those teams to move faster, do things in a consistent way, things like that. So how do you help those many, many engineering teams be able to focus on, I'm going to build this feature and then ship it, whether to staging or production, and not have to worry about all the infrastructure. So we do a lot as an infrastructure team to try to make it very simple to stand up a new service, a new feature. Um, there is a um, framework that you can use that um, basically gives you all the basics of building a microservice, handling RPC calls, logging, uh, connecting to service discovery to find the other services you need to talk to. Um, we also make it very simple. There's a, a single button you can press in our developer console to just create a new project, new source code repo, um, and you get all that stuff um, mentioned that I mentioned before basically for free. You know, you just clone it from a template, so you're never really starting from scratch. And then you have to manage all of these and figure out how they're going to actually stay alive or scale. And you built your own system to do all of that. Yes, we did. So we started to adopt Docker, uh, Docker containers, um, very early on, I think before it was even version 1.0. Um, and we were really excited by it because it added a bunch of new things that we didn't really have great answers for at Spotify at the time. It used to be very painful for teams to deploy changes to their services. Um, they'd frequently fail. Um, rolling back from a failed deployment was pretty tricky. And as a result, people, teams just would not deploy very often because there was a lot of risk and pain with that. So we were very interested in Docker because we thought that building containers would make it a lot simpler. Um, we could just have um, deployments would be a lot simpler. And if you just want to roll back, because each container is kind of atomic, totally separated, um, that would be very simple. Um, another big benefit is that it was just a lot easier for developers to run the service themselves on their laptop, even if it didn't really look like production. So the main reason we were f super interested in Docker to start with was just to make deploying easier, making running services easier, and then to increase the rate at which people were deploying changes and just being productive, basically. And is there anything looking back on that, at least the first chunk of that transition, that you wish you did differently? I would say one thing that I wish we did a little bit differently, we were very conscious as an infrastructure team that we're changing out are basically the platform that we run applications on in production, which was working pretty fun before. It had some features that we wish we had, we that were missing that we wish we had, but things weren't on fire or anything like that. So we wanted to be very sure that what we move people to is super stable, um, they don't really notice any problems, and that it's just all positives for them to move. I think as a part of that, we probably were a little hesitant to take risks, um, and we didn't want really any team to move their service fully to Kubernetes uh, until we were, as an infrastructure team, 110% prepared for that. Um, in retrospect, I think we could have accepted some more risk. The, team, the engineers on all of our teams building these services, they know better than we do as an infrastructure team uh, which services are super important, which services are internal facing and not important at all and can stand some downtime. So I think we could have let them take some more risk and tell us what would be um, you know, like do some more experiments themselves, and we probably would have just learned a few things a little bit faster. Are there other things that you wish you did more of as you were going through this transition process? I think one thing that we found that kind of surprised us as we did this is we didn't have to do as much selling or um, evangelizing uh, of the move to GKE to the, the engineering teams at Spotify. Um, part of that's because they just they already knew about Kubernetes, like it obviously is talked about quite a lot um, in the development community. But also we found that some early adopting teams um, were really happy with the results. And so they would go out and talk to other teams and give uh, talks at like an internal conference that we do or um, 
just they would try to motivate their peers. Um, so I wish one thing we could have done more of perhaps is try to take advantage of that, create more sort of uh, champions internally, because um, those were really, those engineers who did that work were really the best selling point that we had for convincing other teams to spend time on this. If you enjoyed this episode, check out the StackChat playlist for more videos.